continue, continue. Now, the two things, the two things I want to talk about, the two things I want to talk about now, shh, is to convince you that, is to convince you that you gain a lot. You gain a lot by, by doing this, by looking at the localized rider macro averages instead of the global ones. And I won't be able to actually, to actually compute things for you because it's, it's, the, the, the computations are rather, rather difficult. Um, all I want, I, I, I try to convince you of two things. One thing is that from the entropy point of view, but we have to, we have to show two things. We have to show that Going to the star-shaped hull doesn't increase the class by much. That's the first step. The second thing is that when you intersect things with an, a ball like that, so functions with small with small variance, you gain something. Okay, so that's that's the two main things I want to address at first. And then there is a question which comes naturally from all the practitioners. How do you compute this using just your data? And that's the last thing I want to talk about. So the first two results are in some sense how to estimate your localized Radomaka complexities using what I call global data. And what I mean by global data is assume that you know something about the structure of your original class. Assume that you know, for example, it's a class constructed using color machines, or assume that you know something about the covering numbers. Can you say something about the Radomaka complexities associated with this? Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Now, before I get into that, after we've talked about why Radomaka averages, the reason, the mathematical reason they appear naturally, I want to show you sort of uh, an intuitive way, which I personally don't like, but I know a lot of people do like, an intuitive way of understanding why rather macro averages are in some sense a good way of looking at things, of measuring a richness of a class. So. So what I'm going to do at first is to look at what I, let's call, an empirical version. The empirical version would be 1 over square root of n, the expectation over the epsilon i's, supremum of f and f, sum epsilon i, f at x i, for a fixed sample. So you fix the x i's. To get to the rather local complexities, all you do is you take the expectation with respect to the random variables. But as I said, if you fix a sample, you can look at it as some sort of a projection, a random projection onto an n-dimensional space. It takes your class, which is a class of functions, into a set of vectors, fx1, fxn, where f is an f. Okay, that's, that's what you get. Now, how do you measure a rich, the richness of, of your class? So one way of doing that is asking, how well is your class correlated with random noise? The epsilon i's represent random noise, right? Flipping signs. You can have Gaussian random variables instead of them, and that's exactly noise, okay? And now, what you're asking, is how do these set of vectors, how well are they correlated with random noise? This gives you sort of a measure of complexity for each one of these classes, okay? Projected classes. Okay, so for every separate sample you get this measure of the complexity. Now you're interested 
In the wave, your original measures, your original measures measure waves over different samples. So it could give, it could assign a lot of weight to, um, to, to samples for which this is really, really small and negligible weight for samples for which this is large. Okay? So that's where your probability measure on the space comes into the game. The, the geometrical, in my eyes, the right way of looking at it is just a question of random projections and the way each pro the weight that each projection carries depends on the probability measure on your space. And the reason why this is a good so the, the engineering way of saying, well, this is a good measure of complexity for each, each projected set is um, simply looking of, on how well this is correlated with random noise. But there's a different way of looking at it, which involves norms in Banach spaces. I'm not going to talk about that. So now, let's go back to the star-shaped hull and the intersection of a star-shaped hull with a ball which simply is all the functions with relatively small variance, variance at scale epsilon, which is the required deviation we want. So the first thing I want to convince you that if you look at the, from the entropic point of view, the cousin numbers of the star-shaped hull and of the original class are the same, essentially the same. Remember, the W's bound on the, on the covering numbers said that the radical averages of a projected, you know, you fix a sample and you project onto that sample. The radical average of, averages of this sample are bounded by the integral of the log of the L2 entropy. So W's bound was that 1 over square root of M, the expectation of supremum of F sum epsilon i fxi is bounded by this square root of log l2 mu n d epsilon but in fact I don't need the epsilon here instead of the epsilon all I need is something which is measures the diameter of the set, right? Because if I know that my class is in a ball, containing a ball of, of radius r, or I can, I, it's enough for me to take this radius here. Right? So all here, in fact, what, what you have is the radius of a sufficiently small ball containing this class. What? Mm -hmm. uh, I just need to give you some more bad rates. Mm -hmm. So, in general, if f, or if for every f, one over n sum f squared of x i half is less or equal than r. Then one can replace the infinity with R. Okay? Because just like we had with the zero with, with with the assumption that the, the functions are bounded by one, okay? If I know that all the functions satisfy this. If I take um, any epsilon larger than R, I can take zero as the cover. Because every function would be in a ball of radius, of radius R around zero. So in fact, you can have R here. Now, this is almost 
getting what I want, right? It's almost right because here I have R and up, up there what, what I have is the intersection of your star-shaped hull with a ball of radius R. There is of course a very big difference between the two. This is a ball with respect to the actual measure, functions with variance bounded by epsilon. This is with respect to the empirical measure. So in order to connect the two and use this, I'll be able to, I, I should, I will have to give you a way of estimating empirical, the empirical radius using the actual radius. Okay, and that was done another result by Michel Talagrand. So there's a way of connecting the expectation of this if you know that all your functions are in such a ball. And that's all one will need to use Dudley's entropy bound and the fact that you have functions of small variance. I'm not going to get into the details of that. The next thing is to show that, okay, the both small radius is fine, but I've taken the star-shaped hull. It might have increased the, my class enormously. Okay? Um, for example, taking the convex hull would. There are estimates on how the, the way a, a, a class can increase by taking its convex hull. Very bad. You want to show that your class doesn't increase by much by taking the star-shaped hull, and it should be in that sense, right? You don't care if your covering numbers increase by something which looks a lot, as long as the log covering numbers don't increase by much. So you have some, I mean, polynomially increasing things that doesn't, doesn't matter much, okay? So I'm going to explain why this doesn't increase by much, and the explanation is really very simple. Um, First of all, take zero, this is zero, and this is one function, okay? And suppose I have some function which is epsilon close to this one, okay? So let's call this G, and you know that this is smaller than epsilon the distance with respect to your predetermined norm. It doesn't matter which norm. Okay? Now, you want to be able to control the cover numbers of this line. Okay? At a scale epsilon. Okay. So look at this line and divide this interval at proportion, proportions epsilon. Right? So this is epsilon apart, this is epsilon apart, this is epsilon apart. Okay? And do the same here. Okay? Now you know that this set is an epsilon cover of this line. Okay? Just an epsilon cover. And you know that the distance these distances are also smaller than epsilon just because basic Euclidean geometry. Okay, because this is smaller than epsilon and this is smaller than this and this is smaller than this and this is smaller than this. Okay, so the distance between points, so points here are two epsilon cover of this line. How many points do I need to do that? Do I need to cover this? Well, it's just something like the length of the line divided by epsilon. The length, of, uh, the length of the interval. The length of the interval is simply the norm of G, right? And we can always assume that the norm of G is bounded by 1 because then we know that this holds for F, okay? So, the, to cover this line, all you need is something which is proportional to the norm of F, divided by epsilon. When you take the log of that, it's something which behaves like log 1 over epsilon, which is really insignificant. Okay? Now, where is this? Uh, here it is. 
Now, this is your F. So this is F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. This is 0. Take a cover of F. Okay, we want to compare the log covering numbers of the star shaped hull with the log covering numbers of the class itself. Take a cover of F. Okay, so this is a cover of F. G1, G2, G3, G4, G5. Take these intervals, do what we did. Divide them at scale epsilon. This is a cover for the star-shaped hull of F. Okay? F might be very large. I mean, it might be a cloud here, right? It could be infinite. And how many elements we have? We have elements, the number, the cardinality of the cover of F at that scale, and each one of the elements in the cover of F contribute something of the order one over epsilon because you need to cover this entire line. Okay? So the cover numbers of the star shaped hull behave something like the cover numbers of F times one over epsilon. When you take the log, you get something which is like the log cover numbers of F plus log one over epsilon. Completely negligible. Okay? So that's how you control the log cover numbers of the star shaped hull. Now if you combine this fact and what I told you before about the, the fact that you can use another one of Tyrone's result to connect this thing with this thing, the empirical radius with the actual radius, you can get, for example, the following, um, the following deviation estimate or the following estimate on the, on the Radomach complexities. I never remember those. I'll give you just, just the one in the polynomial case. Uh, no, I won't. I'll just, I'll just give you the... Just give you the sample complexity that comes out of this. Okay? So you can estimate, estimate um, in this way. It's, it's technical, it's not easy, but it's doable. The Radomach complexity is using the cover numbers, and the way to do it is you have the cover numbers of the star shaped hull, you replace them by the cover numbers of F plus the extra log one of epsilon you get from going to the star shape, and then you use this connection, which gives you an estimate on the Radomach averages. As a result, you get the following, for example. I always lose this. Okay, so you get, so, firm, um, assume, that, fat epsilon g, less or equal than, gamma epsilon to the power minus p, and p is between 0 and infinity. Um, let f be the loss class. Then the probability that there exists an f and f with a small empirical minimizer, but a large, so a, a small empirical expectation, but a large actual expectation, is smaller than delta, provided that n is greater or equal. Now here we have two cases, p between one, zero, and two. I'll have it here. P between zero and two. P greater than two. 
And here I have C, which depends on PN. It's gamma, 1 over epsilon to the power 1 plus P over 2. And here there are logarithmic factors, which I'm going to ignore. And here, 1 over epsilon to the power P. Now, one can show that this is tight. Okay, 1 over epsilon to the power P, P greater than 2. And this is exactly the Glevenko Cantelli estimate. In some sense, this tells you that doing this entire localized thing doesn't help you at all if your class is too large. So if your, cl if your class passes the P equals 2, then doing all this complicated stuff and doing the Glevenko Cantelli stuff, the original stuff would give you exactly the same estimate, and that estimate is tight. Okay? I, I haven't shown it, but it's true that this estimate is tight. The other thing is what happens between P0, 0, zero and 2. Okay? So the last thing here is that when P approaches 0, you get a scale which is something like 1 over epsilon, which is the absolute minimum. As P approaches 2, you get something which is 1 over epsilon squared, which is the right rate. So this is sort of a, a linear interpolation between P equals 0 and P equals 2. Um, it's still open whether this bound is tight, I'm willing to bet it is. That in general, if you want to get a statement which holds for every, um, every class of functions bounded by 1, using the fat chattering dimension, the polynomial scale, this is the best you can hope for. Um, still open, if anyone solves it, let me know. It's a constant which depends on P and on gamma. You can compute it. I'm just lazy. I don't like constants. Just interested in rates. But it's computable, I mean, you can get, you can, it's not huge. That's, that's, uh, you can get exactly the dependence on it on and on P. So that's one example. The other example, so this, this was done using, so the, the using, First of all, knowledge on the fat chattering of your original class, that gave you, using the covering result, an estimate on the covering numbers of that class. There's a way of computing the covering numbers of the lost class once you know the covering numbers of the original class. So you have the covering numbers of the lost class, which, which is F. Then, using the covering numbers of F, you computed the covering numbers of the starship hull of F. Okay? And then, after you did all that, then you used what I just erased. That is entropy bound and the connections between an empirical radius and an actual radius. Okay, which gave you an estimate on the right of the macro averages. The other example is kernel machines. And I'm only going to mention, I'm not going to even to specify all the conditions and definitions and whatever. I'm only going to mention that the local, the, the what are the averages for the entire kernel class? Okay, the entire kernel class, you can show that it behaves, when I write this, it means equivalent up to absolute constant. So it's, it equals that, it's bounded by what I'm going to write times the absolute constant from above and from below. So sum i equals 1 to infinity lambda i squared. That's just the trace of the integral operator. And if you're looking at f epsilon, that's the kernel class intersection with all of them. I mean, the kernel class, all the functions in the kernel class will be variant smaller than, smaller than epsilon. And this is equivalent to sum i equals 1 to infinity, the minimum of epsilon and lambda i squared, where in both cases the lambda i are the eigenvalues of the integral operator um, associated with your, with your, um, with your integral operator, um, that is the integral operator associated with the measure you have. Now the reason that this is significant, the way it's written here, is that these bounds are tight, 
That means they give you the right rate in which things are handled, but at the same time they're completely useless because you don't know the measure. Right? So this controls your, this gives you the right estimate on the sample complexity, but there's no way you can compute it without knowing the measure. So as far as kernel classes are concerned, what people would like to do is to replace these eigenvalues by the eigenvalues of the gram matrix. So instead of looking at the eigenvalues of the integral operator, the integral operator takes f to the integral of k x y f y d mu y. Look at the eigenvalues of the matrix k x i x j, where these are the points you sample. And to normally like, to make this look more like this, you need to, to divide things by one over square, one over n. Uh, 1 over n squared. No, 1 over n, sorry. Okay, so this is a matrix. You can compute everything here. Right, you, can, you know how to compute this. You can compute its eigenvalues, and it would be great if you can say, instead of using this spectrum, which I have no way of finding out because I don't know the measure, and by the way, even, even if I had known the measure, it would be almost impossible to compute it because one of the biggest problems in, in differential equations is, is you know, finding the nice, de the nice decomposition for, for integral operators. It's, it's, it's not trivial. So this is difficult if I can replace these by the eigenvalues here and still say that I don't lose much and this is the right thing would be great. And at first when I try to solve this, what I tried to show, and I wasn't the first, there were a lot of mathematicians trying to work on that, trying to show that in some sense, this operator approximates this operator in the right sense. And people got estimates um, that in some sense, when you average over the spectrum of this, you get something which is very, very close to the spectrum of this. Very difficult result using very sophisticated machinery, but they aren't good enough because they didn't give rates. But you, you, you could say that asymptotically things are nice, but you couldn't say more than that. Uh, lately, Peter Bartlett and I were able to show that you don't need that. That in fact, you can, instead of looking at this, you can look at, let's call it empirical, and you still get the right result. Okay, but I can't get, it's, it's too complicated, but it, it doesn't use sort of a concentration result. It doesn't say, this approximates this, therefore this is the same. It uses something else, which I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes, which will be the last five minutes of my course. And the question that every practitioner which I showed him this asked me is, okay, that's really nice. If I know something about the class that gives me the best bounds, I'll give you that. How do I compute it? Here is the data. How can I use it to compute this? Remember, what we have here is what we have here is an estimate, is um, expectation when you go over all the samples. So in some sense, you need to see all the samples to compute this. The point is that in fact you don't. So let's write exactly what we have in Rn. What's Rn of something? So Rn, in our case, would be the expectation over all the samples, the expectation over the signs, the supremum of the elements in your class with the, expect the fact that the variance is bounded by epsilon, some epsilon i, h to xi. Okay, and in this case, h is the star-shaped hull of a loss class. So I'm just going to write the loss class, okay, just to remember what it is. And h is a star shape. It's g minus t squared minus p g t minus t squared, where g is in g. Okay? Okay. Several problems in computing this. That's 
purely computational point of view. You can't do that. You have to average over all samples. You can't do this. You have to average over all signs. And you have 2 to the power n signs, which is a lot. Okay? You can't compute the value of h at xi because the value of h at xi depends on the value h is a loss function. Remember, it depends on the value of this at xi, which you don't know. Okay? It's, it's totally, the way it's written now, it's impossible to compute. Too many problems. And another one, very important problem, how do you see when your actual variance is small? You can't see when your actual variance is small because to compute a variance, you need your entire class. Well, you need, you need your entire space. Right? You can't use it, do it using a sample. Very, very difficult to compute. Okay. Now I'm going to do a few things which are completely unjustified at first. I'm not going to justify it here. Okay? But I'm going to do three things. First of all, I'm going to erase this and replace this by a sample, a fixed sample. Then I'm going to erase this and replace this by a particular selection of epsilon i's. Okay? Instead of averaging, I'm going to randomly pick a sample and randomly pick a realization. Then I'm going to take this and replace this by 1 over n sum h squared xi less than epsilon. Let's have a 2 epsilon here. So I replaced a ball. I can't compute this. I can't see whether a function has a small variance or not. I can't check this. Whether it has a small empirical variance on that sample. This one. And then I'm going to change L to the following class of functions, random class of functions, will depend on the sample, g minus t squared minus, and here's the change, g star minus t squared, g is in g. Where g star is the empirical minimizer. Okay? So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, is follow very simple algorithmically, okay? I'm going to take, I'm going to take a fixed sample, a fixed sample of signs. Look, compute this thing over all, right, over all functions which satisfy this, but these functions are not loss functions because they're not, in some sense, centered at the best approximation, but neither centered at the empirical minimizer. Looks like voodoo magic. This is computable, right? Everything here is computable. You know the values, of, you have your sample, you have the values of your empirical minimizer of that sample, you have the values of your target function of the sample, that's just the yi's, right? You know this, you know this, you can compute this, everything's computable. And the amazing fact is that the thing I had before on the blackboard and this thing are essentially the same. Okay? You can show this with very, very high probability under very, very mild assumptions, in fact, no assumptions. This and this are the same. And they'll be the same, let, let's be accurate, they'll be the same as long, well, as far as we're concerned, they will be always the same. Okay? The, the, the error would be, there'll be some error, right? They can't be the same, but the probability that they deviate by something significant decays exponentially. So from the computational point of view, in some sense, you can do this. And still give you, this gives you an estimate on the rather macro complexities of the class. This gives you a way out of computing something which is called error bounds. And error bounds are just a way of asking a similar statement to the one we asked, which is, you have your class of functions, you have a sample, you find the empirical minimizer, let's call it gn star, and you want to, to see whether the expectation of gn star is less or equal than the expectation, the actual expectation of g star, or let's call it fn star, because it's in the last class. 
then the empirical expectation of f, fn star plus something small. This is exactly the sort of question we were sort of working on, right? You know that this is small, you want to ensure that this isn't too large. That's another way of formulating this. And the question is, what's something small? Okay, and the point is that the best thing you can hope for is A, that this would hold with high probability, and the minimal value of something small as a function of n is something of the order 1 over n, which corresponds to a sample complexity estimate of 1 over epsilon in a sense. Okay? So when I say that this and this are essentially the same, means that the probability that they differ by something which is significantly larger than this is relatively small. Okay? So you can use this, gives you a good estimate on the Radomachal complexities, and you're done. That's how you can use the Radomachal complexities to, um, you know, you can actually compute them. Now, it's slightly more complicated than what I wrote. To do it, to do it in practice, you need some sort of an iterative procedure, and I'm not going to get into that. The first people who thought of this kind of an idea, they didn't have all the elements here, but a similar sort of an idea were Kolchinsky and Panchenko um, a year and a half ago, and they had something. This, what I wrote here, was done last week. So it's... Um, you're the first in the world, well, let's peer it to somebody. So you're the first to hear about it. This is brand new. We, I said it with absolute certainty, as if I'm convinced it's true, I am convinced it's true, but to be totally uh, fair, um, the number of people who actually saw the proof and are convinced it's true are just myself, Peter, and maybe Olivier Bousquet, who is sort of our co-author. So, I wait, if I were you, wait a few weeks, then we'll tell you whether it's true or not. I'm willing to bet a lot of money that it, it works. Okay? So one good thing certainly came out of the summer school. The reason that we were able to do it was because Peter was here. Um, and I hope, I hope you will, if you actually want to do stuff in practice, I hope you will start using an idea similar to this. Because I think that unlike all the parameters that people spend years investigating, like the fat chattering dimension or the entropy or the covering numbers, they're just upper bounds. They're, there are ways of controlling the sample complexity of the problem or the error rates of the problem. They're not the right quantity. I think that one is. Okay? Um, and I'm trying to convince as many people as I can. I hope I did a good job here. So, uh, thank you very much for your patience and time. And I hope to see you all next year, if you decide to come. Um, by the way, for those asking, the reason it's not in the notes, this stuff, is because it was written after the notes were written. Uh, now, we have for you sort of attendance certificates we want to hand out. And we would like to do it during the... Um, to your coffee break. So if we can all meet in five minutes in that room, we'll just give it to each one personally and say thank you for coming. Have a nice day.